Well, good morning, Fellowship family. It's good to be with you guys. My name is Jeff Fritchie. I'm uh, the lead pastor of White Rock Fellowship, which was a church plant of fellowship. Many of you uh, will remember uh, now almost uh, a little more than 10 years ago, uh, White Rock Fellowship was planted by fellowship, and uh, it's a great joy to be part of the fellowship family. Uh, I remember I officed here while we were meeting in schools and we were planting, and then now as a church, we have uh, continued that legacy of fellowship of church planting and have planted a church in Lakewood and are bringing on a new church planner now uh, to, Lord willing, plant another neighborhood church in East Dallas uh, next year. And so we are thrilled to be a part of the Fellowship family and continue that legacy uh, that has been here at Fellowship. And it's just great for me personally uh, to be back with you uh, this morning. And it's good to be together and worshiping together. Uh, I went to Baylor University. I grew up in Dallas, but I went to Baylor. And um, when I was there, it was kind of this unique blend of, of kids who grew up in church, but not really a, a religious kind of experience experience that I had at, as, at, at the school, but uh, because you have a big group of kids who grew up in church, uh, there were some things that kind of happened with them. In fact, there were some of these kind of outward trappings of religion that kind of people carried forth, whether they were following Jesus or not. In fact, one example of that that always just kind of surprised me is that all the freshmen, we, we, ate, uh, at, we ate all of our meals in the dorms. And so on Sunday mornings, if you kind of came down for lunch and, and you, had, you were not dressed up for church, it was really obvious you didn't go to church. And so what would people do? This shocked me. People would actually sleep in, dress up like they went to church, and then walk downstairs and come down for lunch. Talk about missing the point, right? I mean, as if the whole idea was to like look like you were faithful. The appearance of, of, of going and being with God's people and, and worshiping God, but, but actually no, just what really matters is what people think about that. What was going on there? They were more concerned about looking the part. They were more concerned about uh, following the rules or at least looking like they followed the rules. Right? The appearance of faithfulness. And often in Jesus' ministry, he encountered people like this. They were the hyper-religious. Uh, they were the Pharisees. They were the religious elite of the day. And what they cared about was what people thought. They cared about this, the outward appearance of faithfulness as opposed to faithfulness in Jesus, faithfulness in following God. And Jesus did not mince words when it came to this issue. In fact, some of his strongest words were, were uh, reserved for the Pharisees. And so today, as we look at this calling of Matthew, or as he's known in our passage, Levi, there's something about the calling of Matthew that really upset the religious elite. I mean, this gets under the skin of the Pharisees that he would call Matthew. Now, again, the Pharisees, they saw it as kind of their, their life was to, to basically protect the reputation of God. And so when Jesus calls someone like Matthew, they said, that's not protecting the reputation of God. This calling of Matthew actually exposes something in the Pharisees. And in fact, at the end of our passage that we're going to look at in chapter 3, verse 5, Jesus, it says, and he looked around at them, at the Pharisees, with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. This calling of Matthew that we're going to look at today exposes the hardness of heart in the Pharisees. And in this passage, what does hardness of heart look like? It looks like staunch religion. It looks like caring deeply about meeting expectations. It, it cares about looking the part. It cares about the rules and it cares about having the right people around you. And so it grieves Jesus and it makes him angry. It grieves Jesus because they were missing out on all that was available in relationship with him. And it makes him angry because they were making it seem like faith in God, being the people of God, was just this dead religious activity with no purpose or reason or life. And so the Pharisees' hard heart, it impacts a few things. It impacts who they hung out with or who they called in or out. It impacts what they do, causing them to do these religious things while slowly forgetting their original purpose or meaning. And it impacts why. It gives them this skewed perspective. And certain actions and activities actually become more important than people. And before we're too hard on the Pharisees, we have to take a moment to look inwardly and to see our own tendencies towards a hard heart in similar ways. 
Maybe we find ourselves today living a, a religious life, but instead of enjoying a, a grace-filled, life-giving, healing, restorative relationship with Jesus, we find ourselves constantly defining who's out and who's in. Or to put it another way, we're, we're always talking about the other. Or maybe we find ourselves simply just going through the motions in our religious life, or, or we find ourselves missing the why, missing the grace of God that we just sang about that changes everything. I think it's at least worth it to ask the question of ourselves, in what ways do we have a tendency towards a hard heart? And so let's look together at the, this calling of Matthew and how it ex, what it exposes in the Pharisees. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Mark chapter 2, uh, and we'll start in verse 13. He, Jesus, went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, or Matthew, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. So that first characteristic of a hard heart is it has to do this with this idea of a misunderstanding of, of who. A hard heart impacts who we spend time with. It impacts how we identify people. Now, it's hard to underscore how much the Jews hated tax collectors. Even known Jewish scholars who disagreed on everything, they all agreed about their hatred towards tax collectors. Now, Levi, or Matthew, as he's, as he's known, is a tax collector. And what does that mean? That means that he is banned from the synagogue He's disowned by his family. It was actually legal in that time to lie to a tax collector. Can you imagine that? Why? Because what are they doing? They're betraying their own people by getting rich off of unfair taxes, again, taken from their own people. And so when Jesus calls Matthew, this had to be one of the most misunderstood moments in Jesus' early ministry. I don't know if you are or have been over the last year or so been watching the, the series called The Chosen. Uh, it's a series, it's a well done series about the life of Jesus and in particular uh, about the followers of Jesus who are walking with him. Uh, and I, I, I love this show and every time I watch this show I, I just start crying. I'm not really a crier. Um, in fact, so much so that my kids know this about me. In fact, one of my kids walked down and he was like, Dad, are you okay? And he, he looks over and he goes, oh, you're just watching The Chosen and just keeps going. I'm um, crying and leaving me in my tears there. Thanks, son. Uh, but this moment when Jesus calls Matthew in the show is one of the most powerful, impactful moments. They did such a great job of showing us how hated he would have been among his own people, how isolated he was as he walks by his family celebrating a feast that he's not invited to, how he was an outcast, how he was completely on the outside. They show how hated he is, in fact, so much so that even Peter, who has his own kind of issues, says to Jesus, you're sure gonna call this guy? And Jesus says, and, and Peter says, that's different. And Jesus in the show says, get used to different. The who is different. Now, it's bad enough that Jesus would actually allow Levi to follow him, but then he goes to his house and he attends a party with all of his tax collector friends. They eat dinner together. So all these people who are ostracized, all these people who are not allowed in the synagogue are now sitting around and eating with Jesus. And eating in the ancient world was a, was a symbol of acceptance and love. And, and so the Pharisees, they call out one of their most often critiques of Jesus. He eats with sinners. Why would he do that? Sinners, the Pharisees, was defined by anyone who did not follow the Pharisees' traditions. And so Jesus' critics believe he should not associate with such people. And Jesus' answer is very compelling. When Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Now he's using righteous uh, ironically here because the Pharisees were self-righteous. Self-righteous people see no need for true righteousness because they already view themselves as righteous. They have no need for Jesus' salvation. 
Now, Jesus spent time with the people who saw their need for the gospel. One commentator, uh, William Barclay, he says it like this. The one person for whom Jesus can do nothing is the person who thinks himself so good that he does not need anything done for him. And the one person for whom Jesus can do everything is the person who is a sinner and a failure and who knows it and who longs in his heart of hearts for a cure. To have no sense of a need is to have erected a barrier between us and Jesus. And watch what he says here. To have a sense of need is to have a passport to his presence. Pharisees have a hard heart. They have a wall up that says they're not the kind of people that need Jesus' salvation. Hard hearts actually make it really difficult for us to see our own need for Jesus. And hard hearts change the way we see other people as well. Over time, even believers in Jesus can begin to take on this sort of self-righteousness. We slowly forget our desperate need for Jesus. We forget our desperate need for salvation and for forgiveness and for restoration and for healing. And it can start to sour the way we see other people. And I wonder for us, if we're honest right now, who, who's the other Who's the one we would be surprised to see Christians hanging out with? Maybe it's someone who has a different view on things. Maybe it's somebody who sins differently than we do. Maybe it's someone who goes to a church with different views. We have to resist this cultural wave we are in, which is a world of tribalism and categories. Jesus doesn't seem to do that. He eats with them. He enjoys a relationship with them. Now, Jesus' acceptance and eating with them is not tacit affirmation of everything about their life. We have this weird definition of love right now as a culture that, that to love someone means that you have to affirm everything about them. And, and yet no one actually loves like this. No one would say to a parent, you really don't love your kid because you do not affirm his desire to run into the street, right? No one loves like that. Loving does not equal tacit affirmation. Jesus is not saying, it's okay that you're robbing people blind and that you're betraying your own people with dishonest business practices to make yourself rich to the tax collectors. He's not saying that's okay. In fact, his other interactions with tax collectors, even like Zacchaeus, for example, he gives back four times what he stole from people. Jesus' interaction with them transforms them. But he sits with them. He loves them. He relates with them. He eats with them because Jesus loved them as people made in the image of God. And in that process, he transforms them through a relationship with him. One hint of a hard heart is how we see the other. Do we see them as Jesus sees them? Do we see them made in the image of God? Do we see them as we see ourselves, as those radically in need of God's grace? Just like Jesus said, it starts with seeing our own need. The sick need a physician. Or as Barclay says, it's our own need that is the passport to his presence. And therefore, we extend that same grace and love to others. When we spend time with people, do people feel like, they are experiencing this love and acceptance? Do they see an experience uh, with us that helps them make them see Jesus' truth and his grace as more attractive? Hard-hearted people don't do either of those things. And it grieves Jesus because they're missing out on this radical grace that Jesus is coming to give. And it angers Jesus because they're portraying a life of following him is, is that you have to follow these certain rules to gain acceptance into the community. But Jesus ate with people who experienced his grace, his kindness, his love, and his mercy, and they were forever changed. True followers of Jesus, like Matthew became, recognized their deep need for God's grace and they extend that to others. The Pharisees missed that. Now, I want to continue in this passage because this calling of Matthew right here in the Gospel of Mark actually amps up the Pharisees' uh, criticism and the Pharisees' questioning that they have of Jesus. It exposes even more of their hard heart because not only does, do their hard-hearted Pharisees care about who Jesus hangs out with, they care about what he does. And so watch with me as he continues in this, verse 18. 
Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And people came and said to him, why did John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it. The new from the old and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins and the wine is destroyed. And so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. And so a hard heart is not only a misunderstanding of who, but it's also a misunderstanding of what does it mean to follow Jesus. The Pharisees believed if they could live perfectly... If they could set up rules on top of the law, then they would usher in the Messiah. That's how they saw the world. And so what they did is they were fasting on Mondays and Thursdays, which is not in the law, but it was an additional fast to give themselves this idea that if we could all do this, then the Messiah would come. Jesus says, the Messiah is here. Nobody fasts at a wedding. Why would you fast now? The Messiah is here. They're missing the point of this. And and Jesus' presence with them is like a wedding festival. He's here now. And a relationship with him brings joy and freedom and hope and restoration and feasting. Now, Jesus uses two more metaphors that are broader than simply the issue of fasting. He says, what I'm coming to do is new And new things don't fit into old things. A new garment sewn onto an old garment will not work because the new part will shrink. Uh, And new wine and old wineskins with no elasticity will not work because when it expands and ferments, then the wine and the wineskin will be lost, he says. As one of my old seminary professors used to say, the Pharisees wanted to maintain their practices that were threadbare and inflexible. And Jesus is saying what he's coming to do is new. The who is new? It's anyone who has need for Jesus and and trusts in him. And the what is new. It's a different kind of following. And the hard-hearted Pharisees, they were fasting. They were practicing their religious activities all the while missing the point of their religion. Hard hearts often practice religion. Do the things that we feel like we're supposed to do while missing the purpose in them. And so not only did their hard hearts cause them to understand, misunderstand who and what, but also why. The third characteristic of a hard heart is a misunderstanding of why they missed the purpose of fasting, but they also missed the purpose of, of the Sabbath. Look, continue with me. Verse 23. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, have you ever read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and he ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any of the priests to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, catch this, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the son of man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Now, certain Pharisees had rules about the Sabbath, One of those rules was that you could not walk more than 32 steps on a Sabbath. That's like from here to that door. I have long legs, okay? 32 steps, that's what, that was what the, this was like this mechanical, dry, technical, and legalistic thing. They're like, why is Jesus not keeping the Sabbath? I don't know about you, but walking through the grain fields, just eating some grain, that sounds like a Sabbath to me. That sounds like a retreat. And they're so like, what are you doing? They're missing the why. Jesus says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is the Lord, even of the Sabbath. What does that mean? God gave the Sabbath to humanity as as a gift to enjoy, to drink deeply of, to rest, to grow in our relationship with him. Uh, We were created with a purpose. In order to accomplish that purpose, God gave us Sabbath to enjoy a fruitful, life-giving relationship with him. They had missed the whole point. The Sabbath was a gift to cultivate a relationship with him. Hard-hearted people miss the purpose behind religious activity. Now, we uh, can look at them and say, what are they, 32 steps? But yet, we also can miss the point. 
we can go through the motions of, of Sunday mornings, of, of reading the scriptures, maybe even of, of sort of praying without this recognition that all of that is a cultivation of our relationship with God. In fact, notice something in each of these episodes so far. Relationship is key. What Jesus is inviting them to is a relationship with himself. He's enjoying a relationship with Matthew and his friends that night, celebrating uh, the, the love and the grace that Jesus brings. They're experiencing his grace and his kindness and his mercy that they have never experienced elsewhere. And Jesus says, don't mourn and fast because the Messiah is here. It's a banquet. Life is full of joy with him. And Jesus says the Sabbath was made as a gift so that you could cultivate what's actually good for us, which is a relationship with him. And hard-hearted People miss this invitation that Jesus gives. When our hearts are hard, we miss God's grace for ourselves and we miss God's grace for others. When our hearts are hard, we practice religious activities, we go through the motions with little or no connection to experience the one that we were made to relate to. The Pharisees are missing the point. Their religion was threadbare and inflexible. This is not life with Jesus. Following Jesus is an invitation to a lifelong cultivation of a relationship with him. It's an invitation, but the Pharisees do not accept the invitation. Instead, they watch even closer. Watch what happens after this. Again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand, and they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. Jesus was grieved. He was grieved at their hardness of heart because they weren't heeding this invitation to follow him, to experience what Jesus came to bring and what Jesus alone can give. And he was angry because these Pharisees were inaccurately representing God's values in his heart. They were putting rules over people, caring more about tradition than life. All of this misrepresents God and it angers Jesus. Now, I think Jesus could have waited till the next day to to heal the man's withered hand, but he does it to show a point here, to say God's priority is always for people. It's always for relationship. People are made in God's image and God cares deeply about life. Now, how do they respond? I think what's sad about each of these episodes is that the Pharisees are given an opportunity to respond in worship to respond in submission, to respond, to follow him. They could have responded and said, I want that freedom, I want that hope, that restoration, that peace, that meaning that only comes from you. He has the power to heal. He's the reason for the feasting. He's the one who sits joyfully with all the people. He makes no bones about it. This is about him. This weekend, uh, sat with our best friends who Um, Three weeks ago, their 14-year-old was diagnosed with cancer. And I sat with them on the first, with their family and my kids with them, on their first um, round of chemo, which will be a year. And in the midst of intense grief, I think we've cried all the tears we can cry. And in the midst of misunderstanding and in the midst of, of pain, I was blown away by how almost every single conversation we had ended up about Jesus. It ended up in the, in the darkest moment of my best friend's lives to, as they're walking through this in the last three weeks just in a whirlwind. In the darkest moments of what the conversation was, it was about God's faithfulness. It was about hope. It was about meaning that actually comes from a relationship with Jesus. It, it was as Barclay said, need for God is the passport to his presence. The Pharisees are given an opportunity, but they choose not to do it. 
Instead of worshiping him and submitting to him and following him, they persisted in their hard hearts. And what do they do? They, they go and have counsel with the Herodians. The Herodians were people that thought Rome should lead uh, this entire uh, region. They literally disagree about everything except for hatred for Jesus. And they go and say, let's pull these guys together to destroy him. At the end of the day, they could not come to terms with the fact that they had to put themselves in the place of those who are sick, those who are unrighteous, those who are tax collectors, those who are ostracized, those who are in need of healing, in need of grace, and in need of restoration, and they couldn't do it. They couldn't put them, themselves in the place to say, it's need for God that is the passport to his presence. Instead, they held tight to their power, to their prestige, and to their religion. And they miss out on all of it. Hard-heartedness is incompatible with being a follower of Jesus. Following Jesus is an invitation to a lifelong cultivation of a relationship with him. Follower of Jesus is, follower, followers of Jesus recognize their own need for the grace of Jesus and therefore extend it to others. Followers of Jesus do all that we do, not as religious duty, but as a cultivation of our relationship with him. Today, I want to invite us to reflect on this passage and on our, our need for Jesus as the passport to his presence. Maybe it's a reflection on the way our hearts tend to become hard. Maybe it has something to do with, with who that other is. Or, or maybe it has something to do with just the way that we're just kind of going through the, you know, going through the motions, religious activity. It's, it's lost its life and its meaning and, and its purpose and its restorative nature in a relationship with Jesus. And to do that, we're going to partake in communion together. And partaking in communion is an opportunity to, to reflect on what Jesus has done for us to reflect on our deep need for him and to see his answer for that is a meal of acceptance to eat the bread and to drink the cup in remembrance of what he has done for us. And so what I'd like to invite us to do is uh, I'm gonna pray for us and, and um, a song of reflection is gonna be sung over us. It's a song uh, written by a singer-songwriter who's in our church. It's a beautiful song written directly from this passage. And as we reflect on this, what I want us to, to, to see, be open to see, is our own tendencies toward hard-heartedness and our desperate need for the gospel of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, Thank you for your son. And not only his invitation to follow, not only this life and this meaning and this freedom that comes, but also for the reminder that we desperately need it. The reminder that when we forget that, our hearts become hard. Lord, may we remain soft, have soft hearts as we remember we desperately need you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's reflect together and then I'll come back to lead us in communion.
The night that Jesus was betrayed, he ate a meal with his disciples. And he took the bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. An image of what Jesus would go to do to heal the sick, to bring us freedom, to bring us forgiveness. He said, take and eat. In the same way, he took the cup. He said, this is the new covenant in my blood. There's no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. He knew where he was going. He knew the only way for sinners, tax collectors, those in need, like each one of us, to be free, to be healed, to be forgiven, was for his blood to be shed and for to die once and for all for us. Take and drink. Let's pray. Father, as we reflect on Jesus' sacrifice for us, we are reminded that there's no other way. We're in desperate need for a Savior. Lord, may we never forget that. May we never lose sight of the truth of the gospel, that we are like Matthew and all of his friends in desperate need of a savior. And so may we receive that grace from you and may we extend that grace to others. And may our life in following you be truly a cultivation of what you came to purchase for us, a relationship with you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Amen, have a great Sunday. It was great being with you. Thanks so much, Fellowship family.